Okay. Back to you, Katie. Okay. So um, my son um, had uh, a, a disability that really interfered with his development and continues to kind of hold him back in a lot of ways as a young adult. And um, and then I, um, you know, had quit the struggle with schools that I think all, you know, parents, most parents have when their child has special needs. And um, and with the healthcare system and getting his needs met. And um, and then I also taught um, for 10 years, eight, eight years of which were in public schools. And I uh, really like kind of urban teaching. So I taught in Lawrence and Somerville, which had large immigrant populations. And then in my last year of teaching, I was uh, teaching seniors. Uh, in high school in Somerville, and I had a student who was undocumented and kind of, you know, revealed to me in her own transition from high school that um, she had, you know, no way to go to college. She couldn't legally work, couldn't legally drive. It was like after high school, she was kind of falling off a cliff. So then I also I called my state legislator that represented the district that I was teaching in. And uh, she put me in touch with the student immigrant movement, which is um, a, a youth movement of undocumented um, immigrants. And I've been involved with them um, ever since. That was back in 08, so it's been kind of a long time. So I got to know a lot of issues that immigrant families were facing. And plus, I had worked with immigrant families both in Lowell as director of the Big Brother Big Sister Agency there, and I have been an associate director of a nonprofit in, in New York City that was serving uh, new immigrants. And then I decided that I wanted to go back to graduate school, get my PhD in social policy. And I was offered, you know, when I indicated that one of the areas I was interested in was uh, policy around uh, children and youth with, with disabilities. So I was offered a fellowship uh, that was dedicated to disability studies. So in deciding whether to accept the fellowship, I kind of I had to um, I had to make the commitment that my dissertation would be in the area of disability, and I had become so passionate also about um, immigrant integration issues. So I thought about it, and I thought, you know, if it was so difficult for me as a native-born um, English-speaking, highly educated parent to understand my son's developmental issues to get the services that he needed in school and in the healthcare system and um, actually even had to move to another district to get my son what he needed. I just thought, what does a, a new immigrant parent do who, you know, really has no systems knowledge, no network, maybe not the language to communicate? I, so I thought that this is what I really want to look at. So I've been kind of, you know, thinking about this, uh, reading about it, um, did several pilot studies around issues, and so the situation comes out of all of that. So, um, okay, so, um, so for each paper, what I did at the hearing was gave the background conceptual framework method and uh, target journal. So I will do that for you. So um, this dissertation grew out of my concern that public policy and school organizational structure make it very difficult for newly immigrated parents, especially those with low income and public schools, to work together to understand and respond to children of recent immigrants experiencing difficulty in school. Uh, one dimension of the importance of this problem is the sheer number of immigrants in U.S. public K-12 schools. They make up a quarter of that population, which I think is amazing. And um, 
The school-parent relationship is an important one for the child and the parent, particularly if the child is experiencing difficulty. But our public policies towards new immigrants and schools and the way in which our schools are usually structured reduce the likelihood that new immigrant parents will be able to access the services their children may need both within and outside of school. <coughs> okay, you can go to the next. <coughs> So um, this slide notes the common focus of the three papers. All are based on a view that the relationship between parents and schools is critical in responding constructively when children are experiencing academic or social difficulty at school. Paper one uses quantitative methods to look at outcomes that I hypothesized to, to be the result of the relationship between recently immigrated parents and schools given current public policies and school organizational structure. And papers two and three are based on a qualitative case study. I reduce this from two to one because reality hits. Um, that look at the policy and organizational influences on the parents, schools, and the relationship between them as they develop understanding of the students and plans for them. All studies draw on the ecological model of development as an overarching conceptual framework for analysis, and they all draw on relational bureaucracy theory to predict or explain the impact of school organizational structure. <clears throat> so if, um, all right, so I'll come to that later. That uh, paper number one, is a quantitative analysis of state administrative data that compares the access to idea entitlements and integrated settings of elementary school students with and without immigrant parents. The purpose of the Federal Individual, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act is to fully include children with disabilities in public K-12 education. It can be a very important program to children who need accommodations, modifications, or services in order to access curriculum, and it's a legal entitlement. Despite the importance of parent participation in the administration of IDEA and our weak public policy around its integrating new immigrants, there is very little research on the impact of having an immigrant parent on access to IDEA entitlements. And there are two important questions to consider. One, do we need to regularly measure the impact of having an immigrant parent on children's access to IDEA, education, and other developmental services? And two, do we need public policy to strengthen the ability of immigrant parents to access IDEA and other services on behalf of their children? And I think that this has a very very important uh, civil rights implications that uh, because Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibits organizations that receive federal funds from discriminating on the basis of national origin and case laws such as Brown versus Board of Ed establishes the right to K-12 education. So, um, can go to that. Is this okay so far? How I'm doing this? Okay. Um, you mean the next one? Uh, uh, the okay. theoretical framework. Theoretical. There you go. Let's see. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Okay. So this study tests two hypotheses. Uh, the first one is that Massachusetts is less likely to serve children of immigrants than children of native-born parents in its IDEA program, particularly for disabilities that are not readily apparent. And two, uh, children of immigrants served by IDEA are less likely than those of native-born parents to be educated inclusively in integrated settings. So the first one is really about the child find. Um, and, and the second part is really about the planning and the due process components of IDEA. Um, so 
And this is the theoretical dimension, which, of course, you know is very important in academia. <laughs> so, <laughs> but um, I actually, I think that these theories are very interesting. So do you want me to go, go through them or, or just go right to the methodological issues? How do people feel? Number, number two them? seems so huge that... Um, it's actually, I use it in a very small way, a small way. Maybe you could explain that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what is the, can I have like a show of hands maybe of people who want to hear like maybe short synopsis of the theories? Okay. All right. So, um, and I, because I go blank when I'm in situations like this, I'm going to be so Feel free to interrupt me or tell me I'm boring you to death. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the ecological model of human development. Um, here the, the development of the individual consists of interactions between the individual and his or her immediate environments within four nested systems from most proximal to distal. So this includes the microsystem, which is the most proximal one. I actually have a little picture here. Which slide is the picture? Um, oh, I'm sorry. Is this slide eight? The next slide? This one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the blue ball is the um, ecological theory diagram. Mm -hmm. So um, you, the microsystem consists of the individual's immediate setting. <laughs> paper is really um, oh, the, right. the parents of the school that are in there. And then there's the mesosystem, which are consists of interrelations among the individual's immediate settings, so there would be the school parent relationship. The exosystem, which consists of formal or informal social structures that are not directly experienced by the developing individual, but which affect features of the, that individual's immediate setting. And the macro system, which is the uh, socioeconomic, historical, and cultural context and public policies that influence all the other levels. So, um, and we have um, UN human rights theory. Okay. This framework breaks government duties of implementing rights into three categories. To respect the rights, protect the rights, like keep someone else from taking away someone's rights, and to fulfill the rights. Um, and, um, and stipulates that all three are required for the full realization of a right for all persons within a jurisdiction. So what I'm looking at here is really the, that last thing, the fulfillment of the rights is is the infrastructure there to fulfill the rights of children of immigrants, um, that their educational rights? And I'm afraid, no, that it's not there. So uh, if you can't fulfill the right, you can't enjoy the right. Um, okay, and then we have relational bureaucracy. Um, Okay. Relational bureaucracy is a hybrid of the ideal bureaucratic and relational organizational form that combines the potential for caring, timely, and knowledgeable responses of the relational organization with the scalability, replicability, and sustainability of the bureaucratic form. The model proposes that structures can be put into place to encourage reciprocal interrelating across work roles based on shared goals, shared knowledge, and mutual respect between uh, leaders and professionals. So in schools, you have the administrators and the staff among professionals. So that would be uh, among uh, staff that are typically like the language learning staff, the special ed staff, the general ed staff, and, um, and OTs, PTs, speech and language therapists, psychologists, etc. 
and between professionals and their clients. Um, and so that would be the school staff and the parents. And the theory hypothesizes that the process of reciprocal interrelating between uh, clients and professionals, among professionals, and between professionals and their leaders fosters an attentiveness to the situation, to one another as subjects rather than as objects, um, that it allows for an integration of perspectives that can produce caring, timely, and knowledgeable responses to particular individuals served by the organization. So rather than categorizing people and saying, okay, you belong in this box and this is what you get because you're this, it's a more collaborative, um, individualized service that's <clears throat> being delivered. And um, examples of structures that can embed reciprocal interrelating in organizations include hiring and training for relational competence, cross-role performance measures and rewards, cross-role conflict resolution, relational job design, cross-role protocols, and cross-role meetings with relational space. And uh, these structures are designed to support organization-wide norms to meet the needs of particular individuals rather than classes of individuals or groups of individuals. Um, okay, then we have the distributional effects of co-production, which basically says that co-production -co refers to the relationship between the, the professionals and the people who are being served, and co-production you know, really kind of um, the, the concept of co-production is part of relational bureaucracy. And it says that these people, you know, work together to produce the outcome. So it's different from the bureaucratic form where of professionalism, where it's the professional telling the person serves, you know, what they need to do and they have the authority. So, what the distributional effects of co-production says is that when you have public services in which the quality of the service and the outcome of the service really depends on the, the behavior of the people being served, that if, you, if people come into that situation with unequal resources to participate, delivery of the service is going to widen the disparity between the people having unequal resources. So education, yes, so when you're looking at the elementary level, the ability of the school and the parent to really work well together is going to have, you know, an impact on the quality of the child's education because the parent is going to be on, you know, on top of what's happening in school and interacting. And so the the um, the environment for the child is really shaped and affected by that. But if the parent doesn't have the resources to participate, those two children come out of the school looking even more different than they did when they came in. So um, I think that's a really helpful theory for this. And then, then there's Foner's theory about the process of change in immigrating families. And um, Foner views the experiences of immigrant families as shaped by an interplay of structure, culture, and agency. Agency, as immigrants draw on their pre-migration experiences, norms, and cultural frameworks, and undergo a process of change as they experience the social, economic, and cultural characteristics of their new home. So. And so this is the map of how all these theories fit together. So um, I've got um, the human rights. The theory helps to explain the influence of the public policies 
in the child's macro system. Relational bureaucracy helps to explain the impact of the organizational structure of schools in the meso and micro systems. While the theory of the distributional effects of co-production helps to explain the impact of the parent-school relationship in the meso system. And then Foner's theory of family change helps to understand the impact of the parent process of immigration in the child's microsystem. Um, should I do more with that or just go on to the keep going, keep going. All right. Okay, so the research questions for the first study test my two hypotheses. Are children of immigrants less likely than other children to receive idea services if so? Is this particularly true for disabilities um, that are not? And among children who receive idea services, are children of immigrants less likely than others to receive services in integrated settings? So is there a distinction? This is Anya. Um, Katie, are you drawing a distinction between um, undocumented immigrants and those who are here legally? No, because I can't see that in the data. You can't see that in the data. Yeah. Okay. And actually, one of the really interesting problems is that you can't see who's the child of an immigrant in the data mm -hmm. either. So mm -hmm. I have to use a proxy for that. But um, mm -hmm. I decided to go ahead with the study anyway because of the importance of the civil rights issues that are involved to at least <clears throat> take a stab mm -hmm. at it. But in real life, and this is something that I hope I'll have a chance to see in the qualitative study, which I haven't gotten to yet, that being undocumented makes you even in a in a worse in a, <coughs> in a less even the most disadvantaged situation I think in terms of accessing services mm -hmm. for your children and mm -hmm. to the school. Mm -hmm. So in real life, it is very important. Okay, so we can go to the next one. Methods. Um, it's uh, this is a, an observational study using cross-sectional data. The source of the data is the Massachusetts Student Information Management System, which is school administrative data that is a census of Massachusetts public elementary students containing student level information. Um, the systems data that um, well, has, has anyone here worked with the system data? No. Okay. All right. There is, it is available for public use, um, but there are, uh, there's student level demographic data, and then there's also data that identifies the um, school <coughs> and the district, and you can't get that together in public use to protect the confidentiality of students when there are really small numbers. So um, I do have to go through a, an application process to get what I need. Um, and I'm not certain that's going to be possible, but I will try. Okay. Otherwise, that information is available online. It's separate, not combined, but it is available, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think we've run across it. Yeah, this is the data that the federal government, the Department of Education requires um, state education, state and local education agencies to collect from the, the October report, Both. right? Isn't it the October report? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes, it is, is collected every that? October. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, analysis of the data um, for this study will include multivariate logistic regression. Um, should I explain that? No, just go. Okay. <laughs> Alberto knows. <laughs> <laughs> um, my. You were to go. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, well, you know, lost getting a chair. <laughs> <laughs> Alice understands. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, my treatment variable is having an immigrant parent, um, which I will estimate 
from the student's first language because that's not in the SIMS data. It's not in any administrative data, and that's not that's a problem that is not unique to education. I found out that it, the child welfare data also doesn't include any information on whether um, um, a child has an immigrant parent. Hmm. And that information can be significant in terms of policy development around immigrant integration, you know, to kind of look at disparities in access. But it's it's not collected. So are you looking at yeah. um, language spoken home, spoken at home? I'm or looking. I am going to use the there's information on the child's first language. Okay. So that's what I have to use. And. Um, the big dilemma was, at first, when I did a pilot study, I used um, that I considered, as a child of an immigrant, any child whose first language was not English. But that's complicated in Massachusetts because we have so many people in Massachusetts from Puerto Rico with Spanish as a first mm. language. Mm -hmm. and they are, in some ways, I think they sh share some um, some of the same situations that that immigrants do. But in terms of um, idea, I mean, you can ask. You there's an idea program in Puerto Rico, so it's mm -hmm. it's it's like a very different phenomenon. So I'm going to do this two ways with defining the. Uh, children of immigrants as those that, who have a parent, who, those whose first language is not English, and then those whose first language is not English or Spanish. Because other cultures are also yeah. have other languages right. with not necessarily having an immigrant family in addition to. Yes. Yeah. 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 And, and this is something I'm going to have to deal with right. in the analysis of the, the findings, mm -hmm. but um, every time I have looked at this issue, what I'm thinking is that the errors are going to err on the side of caution, so that my result, if I see a difference, this is going to be like very, very robust, because the errors would lead me to not right. see a difference. So anything that you see, the situation is probably more extreme, right? In real life, yes. Okay, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. So what I'm hoping is that I can at least argue for somebody's got to look at this. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it doesn't definitively prove it, but it says, hey, it looks like something's going on here. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So there are two dependent variables. Um, we see of IDEA and for students receiving IDEA whether or not the student is served in an integrated setting. And then the covariates I use are uh, low income which is will be in the data uh, eligibility for free and reduced price lunch. Gender, race, ethnicity, limited English proficiency. Title one, I that was theoretical now that I have my school, the school is Title One, so that's out. Um, and the primary disability and participation in Section 504. Um, and then if I can obtain the school identifiers, I'll check for school and district level contributions to variation. And decide, and then and that will have an effect on whether I use um, higher hierarchical methods or not in my regression, which has an effect on, on the results. And the, the concern there, the, the substantive issue, is that there, there are differences in the way districts, and even within district schools, um, administer IDEA. And so in the analysis, what happens is you get the um, errors, error terms get correlated, and it throws off the level of significance on your uh, coefficient on your um, on the variable of interest. So that's why technically I have to clarify that, but it's also an important substantive issue. Um, the vary from elementary school to elementary school to elementary school. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. In terms of yeah. I mean, it makes some sense that it does yeah. do that exactly because of the yeah. situation. Right. Um, right. Yeah. 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 Uh, stems from having to approximate whether or not a, a student is a child of an immigrant and I'll carefully analyze the impact of using the proxy variable. Um, also, my study assumes, okay, this is very technical too, my study assumes that on average children of immigrants are as likely to have the characteristics that make one eligible for IDEA as native-born children. That is disputed. So. Hmm. There are both sides of that issue. And um, and then without high school, school identifiers, I have the problem of trying to figure out how that biases my mathematical results. Mm -hmm. so, um, and then the next slide shows the, the journals that I had to come up with target journals for the paper. <clears throat> and those are the journals I'm considering. <sighs> Okay, any questions on paper one? I'll go to, okay. Are there journals that are just English for the English language learners that does? Uh... Okay. Only 17% of children of immigrants are English language learners. That uh -huh. it's often conflated. Uh -huh. And that's really one of the things that I'm trying to clarify uh -huh. um, with this study. Yeah. Um, okay, so paper two looks at the policy and organizational influences on schools' ability to meet the needs of children of recent immigrants with low income and work with their parents in that process. And the goals include understanding the influences and developing recommendations to strengthen schools' ability to meet the needs of these students. This study uh, will add to the literature on immigration and education by focusing on children of immigrants at risk of poor educational outcomes and looking at structural processes that influence what schools and parents can do to positively intervene. It will add to the literature on the cultural competence of schools by introducing the importance of organizational structure in achieving cultural competence really the structuring of those relationships between leaders and staff, among staff and between staff and parents. And it will add to a small body of literature that looks at the impact of organizational structure on special education by adding in as highly impactful the component of the parent-school relationship. Like that, the, the parent-school relationship is in a lot of special education literature, but it's usually not linked to organizational structure. So that's the link that I'm trying to make. Um, so uh, this paper has two research questions, one pertaining to the school's processes of understanding and responding to student difficulties and the other pertaining to the ways in which the schools work with students' parents in these processes. And both of the questions look for the policy and organizational influences on these processes. And then these are the two theories that inform this paper, the ecological model of development and relational bureaucracy. And this is again, and again, <laughs> My chair is a theory person, so <laughs> I would have you on the theory. And then, <laughs> do you want me to go into the? No, keep going. Go ahead. You're, you're getting low on time. Okay, so all right. Okay, have about ten minutes left. So I want to make oh, sure you get okay. to hit all the high points. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right. So the third paper focuses on the parents' experience navigating service systems and interacting with school personnel on their child's behalf and seeks to identify the influences on that experience. 
The goals include understanding what this process is like for a new immigrant with limited financial resources and developing recommendations for policies and practices to support new immigrant parents in meeting their children's needs in their new home. This study will build on research on immigrant parents and schools by focusing on recently immigrated parents and the constellation of services that can help understand and address the needs of children struggling in school. It builds on the immigrant adaptation literature by focusing on the experience of parenting vulnerable children. And it also builds on a small body of literature on the access of children of immigrants to special education. And these are the five theories. <laughs> Anyone who wants to know more about the theories, contact me. Okay. And here is a research question. What are the patterns of parent experience navigating the education systems and interacting with school staff on behalf of their children? And what are the influences that shape those experiences in particular ways? Um, okay. The methods. The methods have evolved. Um, so both of these papers are based on a case study. It's no longer a multiple embedded case study. I was going to go with two schools um, in one school district and then within each school eight to ten uh, parents of students in the school. Um, but <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. When I started applying for funding and how to do a budget, and realized I needed twenty-four thousand dollars just to pay for interpreters and mm -hmm. translation and transcription, I said I have to do one school. So I still think it's going to be meaningful because I'm not trying to generalize to a population. I'm trying. I will be generalizing to theory. Mm -hmm. um, so. Hopefully. Um, if I win the lottery, I will do it. I also want to get it done. <laughs> yes, exactly. yeah, yeah. yeah, I can do the right. secondary school later. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, or middle school later, or the high school. The superintendent wanted me to do the high school. Okay, so my selection criteria, I have purposeful selection was my methodology, which is basically because I'm generalizing to theory, I can pick my site and my participants based on getting the data that I need to get. I don't have to worry about um, representing the population. Um, so my selection criteria for schools I did use uh, where I wanted to look um, at school districts with the highest number of immigrant families with low income. Um, and uh, so I came up with a list of like 17 schools and uh, I talked to people and I got the Waltham School District is very interested in the school and there's a principal who's very interested in doing the study. So I have an elementary school in mm -hmm. Waltham that will be my site. And then the selection criteria for the students and parents that uh, the student will currently be in grades one through five and enrolled in the, the Stanley School for School and Doing, enrolled in the school for at least one previous year so I can go back and look at the history. And um, the parent or the school staff has concern about the student's academic or social performance and the parent immigrated to the U.S. from the country within the past 10 years. And the parent has, like, you know, roughly low income. And um, the studies, I'll collect my data through um, uh, in depth interviews with the school principal, um, all staff who are involved in working uh, with each student and each student's parent, and then also documents. And, um, and Katie, when you say staff, that includes their teachers, correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So staff would actually include um, 
anyone in the school who deals with uh, assessing the child, planning for the child, or delivering services mm -hmm. to the child. And that would be like in the school staff and up into the district okay. staff as well. Um, So, and then I think the important thing to say, I can go, if we have time, I can go more into describing the content of the interviews. But in terms of the data analysis, I think that, well, the most important thing is to point out that I'm going to be using both deductive and inductive coding. So the deductive part will be, and that's the way I get to kind of hang my findings on theories because I'll be using my research questions and my the, the um, concepts in my research questions, the constructs in the questions and the theories to for coding of my data, but then I'll also look at what emerges that really wasn't in those theories or contradicts the theories in some way or fills them out in some way. So that is a way that um, I can both kind of, you know, look at reality on the ground and build on the theory. Um, So, and these are just ways of checking for validity that were very important to the faculty. And these are the um, target journals for the two papers. So the papers on the um, the journals for the uh, paper number two on the school on the schools will be um, the paper two journals, and then on the parent. I uh, will be the Journal of Ethnic and Migration Studies. Um, perfect timing. Yeah. Two minutes left. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Seven minutes left, depending on people's time frame. If people have to get to a 1 p.m. meeting, but do folks have questions for Katie? Including folks um, who are telecommuting, you can just yell out if you have something. I'm less familiar with the professional journals uh, that that teachers, educators would look at these days, but they look they all look pretty um, mainstream to me. Are there any uh, <coughs> special education focused kind of um, publications, journals that are out there that might be worth looking at too to make sure that that information gets to them? Yes. Yeah. Like paper, the paper number one journals, like that. These were like really very academic yeah. journals that I was looking at because that's the kind of criteria what you need to do. I have yeah. to use that. But paper number one, um, those are mostly special education. Special education, okay. Yeah. Uh, Katie, when is your target for completion? Is, um, I hope. To have the degree, <laughs> August 2017. So I would have to have everything done by like May, May or June 2017. Because I'm thinking from a policy side too, thinking about reauthorization of ideas and how this work can in help to inform, particularly some of the sections regarding children. Yeah. And family. Yeah. Which would be great. Yeah. When is that happening? Well, it's it's actually uh, probably early next year, the start, um, yeah. the start process. Yeah. Well, I probably already have some things just based on the literature review that, I, that I've that i been doing. Katie, oh, when, you're, when you said immigrant families, are you talking about one immigrant parent? Or like to both of them are immigrants. Both. Both. Yeah. 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 What kind of numbers are you? You have the one school, and so you have. Yes. You must yeah. have an idea. So now the process of recruiting, yeah. <laughs> which is very interesting. I'm hoping. My hope is to find ten parents. And I'd like, ideally, 
that I have two for each grade so that I can see the difference. Like especially like, you know, something like the difference between first grade and fifth grade. And um, I would really like, it's very interesting too, but when I asked the principal like, for doing outreach, I thought I'm going to need interpreters just to even do the outreach to parents to ask them to be in the study and explain the study. So I asked the principal what languages are spoken in the school by the parents. And she said Spanish and there's a little Haitian Creole. And then I got a printout. Well, there are 19 different languages yeah. spoken Whoa. in the yeah. school, three of which I never heard of before. Wow. Yeah. So, um, it, you know, the process, I'm going to need to be like recruiting interpreters to even reach out to the parents. So I'm hoping to get, because I think it's really low, the low incidence language speakers who are, you know, most isolated mm -hmm. and separated from information. So I'm hoping to get those parents, mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah. in the study. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. This is this process. This is what I'm embarking on now, is um, recruiting the parents. And Jamie, oh, sorry, J Jamie, did you have a question? It looked like you were going to say something. You're yeah. muted. Oh, sorry. Can I reiterate the overlap between this work and strand one of the RRTC. And um, John Kramer yesterday on a call presented some emerging findings from their literature review on engaging families and um, specifically talked about the need for very early engagement of families and what that engagement looks like and um, I just I'm gonna work um, to connect me you and Allison up to talk more about that overlapped overlap with strand one on the RTC. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much Allison. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah I think you know for for me, like even the work that I do on transition for partnerships and employment, I feel it relates to that because if if you know students are really can't succeed in elementary school and you know don't get those services and supports that they need to connect to the curriculum, their chances of even graduating from high school are quite reduced and you know, and, and their transition outcomes are not going to be good. So, yeah, it even starts before elementary school, but I think that what happens in elementary school um, does influence the educational and transition trajectories um, for people. Kitty, how do you envision that process of actually engaging the parents yeah. to look like? Like, how will you make um, establish contact with them and start to explain the process? And will you use maybe um, any community-based like advocacy organizations yeah. to help you with that? Or yeah, there are. Um, I'm just really starting to work in this area so my two approaches are through the school and through the community mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so I've been talking to people and they feel that from the community side I should go to the churches mm -hmm. and there's watch which is a community development agency in Waltham that they felt I should work with um, there's a, a radio program for um, for immigrants from Uganda, which is a community um, in Waltham, other, um, there was and there was one Latino organization too, and then through the school, uh, what I'm going to do is have the the principal ask teachers 
for the students in their classroom that they have concerns about academically and socially. And then look, crosswalk, um, look at which of those students, the, um, the Parent Information Center knows the home language preference for each student. So I'll see if the home language preference is not English, then I will reach out to that to those parents with, with an interpreter in their language and see whether they're interested mm -hmm. in the study. Um, and then send home recruitment <coughs> letters from the school translated into those three <laughs> major languages and um, because I just don't have the funds to translate into all of those mm -hmm. languages. Right. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, so that's the recruitment strategy. Yeah, but that, that trusting relationship with, with immigrant families, that's going to be a challenge. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Right. yeah there, there's yeah. a church in Waltham that looks like a planetarium. It's a Catholic church and it looks like a planetarium. <laughs> yeah. And they have their own mass uh, for Ugandans and for Ugandans in community every Sunday. Um, so oh, that must okay. be one of the churches yeah. that you might want to go with. Right. Yeah. Okay. That might be one of the languages yeah. though, that you've never heard of. Right? Yeah. 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 Yeah.